it's a pleasure to be here, uh, have an opportunity to share some thoughts, hear insights from you, and, and really kind of evolve and catalyze the movement. And that is the movement that I think all of us believe in, which is the implementation and the use of digital technology uh, in the healthcare arena, simply to create a safer, better, smarter, happier healthcare system. Because the tension levels of doctors, the, the harried look on nurses' faces, the problems that you know everyone in the healthcare environment is facing is something that I believe we should find ways to change. Can our registration processes in the hospital be as simple and seamless as a, a check-in that you're doing in an international airline? You just walk in there with your passport and with one swipe, they say you're fine or you already printed your boarding card and they're only doing a little document check and even that is reducing. You walk into Hong Kong, no visa, and in a fraction of a second, they're swiping and sending you in. And this is hundreds of computers checking security, criminal record, all kinds of stuff. We need to bring all this into healthcare. And I think that's what all of you as evangelists are doing. The idea of working together, talking together, is to accelerate everybody's path. To pick up knowledge from what's happening abroad, what's happening in India, to look at the laws. And um, I'm just, you know, very privileged to, to be amongst you, to share the same vision and passion uh, as all of you and the team at Apollo, to, to thank our team at Apollo for the tremendous work they do and hope that we can just help accelerate this journey. Having said that, I'll just share a few thoughts. Uh, in this entire space. I wanted to just for, for a minute just refocus on the Indian healthcare scenario with less than 27% of our people covered by uh, a structured good form of insurance uh, with the fact that while you know life expectancy has gone up from 64 years expecting to be around 80-85 by 2030 uh, the fact is that we still have a significantly high infant and maternal mortality we are looking at uh, a very uh, you know difficult time in terms of the increasing incidence of non-communicable disease and its impact we're also looking at the fact that we, by 2030, we will need 3 million more doctors. They say right now we need 1 million more doctors. And some of our doctors are becoming lawyers, so that's also a problem. And other doctors are also becoming Miss World. So I think we need to do something to save our doctors a bit. But interestingly, we also need 6 million nurses and almost 11 million paramedical teams. But the good news is, that actually 17 million people, young men and women, are coming into the workforce every 24 months. They reach that age. So the matter is really to capture the imagination of the youth and enhance the amount of training that we can do in the health sector. And we will be able to solve not only India's problems, but hopefully global problems of health, uh, health worker shortage. And this I think is a very important factor that we must look at. And the reason I even raise this is that it's because we didn't do enough talking about e-learning, new methodologies, changing the MCI curriculum, training doctors on telemedicine, uh, leave alone licensing them. So there's a range of work across every dimension so I wanted to make that small comment but net net the Indian healthcare system is islands of excellence in an ocean of inadequacy we have centers of excellence that can attract even the individuals on stage to say okay we'll come to you for a cardiac checkup we have models of innovation which people from all over the world are looking at including our continuous monitoring and we're taking care of patients uh, in our ICU hubs we're taking care of patients from across the world so India has a lot to offer yet there are many more patients that need to be taken care of in light of all this I think tomorrow's technology will be doing a lot in uh, bringing accessibility, affordability, and ensuring quality. And this will happen in the urban setting as well as in the rural setting. Uh, there, there are a few, I think the, the team had a thought process that I need to talk about something high tech and futuristic. Uh, so you will find a few slides in there. But I also want to share with you a thought process or a concept.
Because in the light of the fact that NCDs is really consuming uh, India and one person dies of a heart attack every 33 seconds and even more scary and sad is the fact that of a silent heart attack, 600 young men under the age of 35 are dying every year of a silent heart attack and this is only those which are recorded. It's not even the people we don't know. And if a 35 year old young man dies, you can imagine its impact on their family. So don't think of the statistic. Think of the impact on the family of a young wife, young children, uh, parents who had hopes and aspirations, probably put their life savings into educating this young man and then they lose him of a silent heart attack. 8.8 lakh cancer deaths in India by 2020 and the number of diabetics in India currently estimated to be at about 85 million now go, will go to 120 million but what is sadder than the fact that we have 85 million diabetics and pre-diabetics is of that 85 million only 35 million know that they have diabetes and of the 35 million who know they have diabetes, under 5 million of them are under treatment and cure and compliance with the HbA1c under control. This gap from 85 million to 5 million can be significantly bridged by technology. Because people may say we have only 19,000 endocrinologists, how can we take care of them? You do not need an endocrinologist to bring HbA1c under compliance, treating every single patient and monitoring them. You use the protocol of the, dab, of the endocrinologist, you implement that protocol, you monitor through technology and what we have is a simple a glucometer device which connects to the mobile phone, which puts data into the PHR, which looks at compliance to your care pathway, and then a chatbot who will immediately message back to the individual saying more insulin, more exercise, less food, whatever it is the protocol, but stays compliant. And I'm really happy to say that 15,000 people on this methodology have brought their HbA1c under control in under 120 days. So this is a proven program. And this is primarily simple technology just being quietly put together to serve the patient and help the doctor. So that's what technology is all about in my mind. And when we look in hospitals and see that 80% of our patients are coming to us with stage three and stage four cancer. And if we had seen them at stage one, we could have treated them simply and cost effectively. We could have saved their life and saved their suffering as well as saved their money. So how can we use technology for wide scale screening? How can we monitor at-risk populations? There's a realm of things and all of you know most of these and you've spoken about a lot of them. But what we need to do is accelerate the pace with which these solutions that we have in our heads or in our workshops or maybe in our hospitals, accelerate the pace with which we can take these out into the world and into the community. I want to share with you uh, two quick evolving paradigms which I think are very important. I think that care is moving. And on one hand, we need to add 100,000 hospital beds. But at the same time, if we can use technology, we will see that care is shifting from the hospital to the clinic, smaller settings. And these clinics could be in rural India, like the EPHC model, which I think we shared with all of you. And now into the home. And a lot of a lot more care and treatment will happen at the home and finally into this 24 by 7 ubiquitous access to care which is enabled by your mobile phone. You will have devices connected to the phone, connected to care treatment plans. It will be driven by AI, it may be driven by WhatsApp doctor messaging but the nature of healthcare is changing. And two big people changing the nature of healthcare is what Dr. Ganapati often refers to as Dr. Google and Professor Facebook. Everybody is checking out with them. And on one side, doctors are not very happy about it. But on the second side, if we look at the fact that in a survey, 80% of respondents said they were happy to look or use technology 
to figure out what their healthcare needs will be. From finding a doctor, which is what 80% of people are doing, to using a device at home, which 60% of people are willing to start using, this will become more and more ubiquitous and accessible, which will enable us to do preventive care at a completely different level than what we're doing today. And that, and therein, lies the answer and the future. So it's something we need to analyze, think about, debate, plan for, structure for, and build our systems to literally unbundle the hospital. The hospital is no longer four walls, however big they may be and however beautiful or active. The hospital is healthcare and healthcare is all over the world. The next paradigm I really want to talk about is this concept of focusing on prevention. I don't know if the slides are big enough. I really apologize for the super small size of this font, but I'll just share it with you and ignore the slide. Uh, basically, everything that we're seeking in healthcare is affordability, accessibility, and quality. And in the current model of healthcare, a patient is sick, he has some symptoms, he comes to the doctor, the doctor tries his best, he does some diagnostics, he may operate, he may give him medication, and the patient will recover, most of them recover, uh, and some may not, and this cycle may keep going on. In the future model of healthcare, which I'm sure all of you subscribe to, we will look at a stratified population or population health, whether you're taking genetic predisposition or you're only taking screening and parameters of uh, whether from cervical cancer, which is incidentally still the number one killer of uh, by cancer of women in India, or you're looking at cardiac risk profiling, you look at cholesterol, you look at lipids, you look at that, you know, that whole subset of uh, comorbidities that exist in a potential cardiac patient and then you monitor and prevent far more effectively so that the rate of incidence whether it's silent heart attacks uh, because you've controlled diabetes or uh, frank MIs or all cardiovascular disease or strokes we bring these down and those that do have you diagnose you treat and you keep them into a care continuing loop so that the number of repeat visits to emergency room, number of repeat heart attacks, how many people do we know have had three angioplasties? Quite a few. How many who have had two angioplasties? Two different incidents. How many have had an MI and then a plasty or a plasty and then an MI? Because what we did in the healthcare system was we repaired the plumbing of the heart, but we didn't remove the cause of having that block in the first place. And all of you as doctors know it. But why can't we redesign the system to create this continuum of care, which is an easy part of what you give in a structured package. So that's something that when we're talking today in some of the ads you may see about reversal of heart disease, that's what we're trying to do. Build a simple continuum of care, diagnose early, ensure they don't have cardiac problems, and it even has a yoga program linked into it. And these become effective. And why I'm talking about all this at a technology conference is that the personal health record, which is at the middle of all these interventions, empowers the individual to do and to take care and to do all these things, to share it with his specialist doctor or his GP or his loved family member in a continuous cycle of caring, which will ultimately lift the healthcare status of the population. And this concept is applicable in pregnant women, which we're doing in Argonda, where besides the nutrition centers, I'm happy to say in the last 18 months, we have not had a single maternal mortality. So it's things like this which can change the whole focus of healthcare and this is what collectively we can do. So please let us as technology evangelists join hands with healthcare evangelists and say this is how we can work together. Because if AI is one fancy cool tool that Microsoft has put but the doctor doesn't know what it means and he thinks it's going to replace him, never the twain shall meet. So by changing, unbundling the hospital and the physical location of care and changing the paradigm of care to be truly healthcare and not ill care, which are not new concepts, but by using technology to embed them into the process of treatment of care, I think we will be doing something very powerful for the future. 
and everything I'm saying is not really new, but unfortunately, healthcare is late to the party. And you know, Netflix changed the way you view uh, view movies, and and Russ spoke about it yesterday. And it's not just from the commercial aspect of how successful Netflix was; it's from the convenience aspect of how their model builds. Similarly, Paytm. Post demonetization, how many of you got a Paytm account? Oh, you are very few. Sheikh is going to be very sad. How many of you got a Paytm account? Yeah, a lot more. Correct. And it's simple. And even my Aya has it. She uses it to buy vegetables. So this is a mobile payment system. So you just click and go. And everybody's using it. From the coffee vendors to the street coconut water seller, everybody's using it. So what is our smart healthcare version of these kind of completely, uh, you know, it's, it's become a way of life. You're doing social networking from, from Facebook to Instagram to uh, WhatsApp. You're, you're using Book My Show. You're using Make My Trip. You're using Paytm. What's the single healthcare app in your pocket? So Practo will be very sad that you didn't say Practo. And Librate will be surprised that you didn't say Librate. But the fact is, ladies and gentlemen, that by just doing booking of appointments, we haven't yet done enough impact into what a consumer wants to have a name up there. But I think it's coming. They're exciting startups. There's a lot of action in India. There will be 20 names there by next conference. I promise you. And many of us will be using these continuously and feeling how these improve the way patients access healthcare. I want some simple things to happen because people are using an app, whether it's an Apollo app or some other app. I want our average waiting time to be not more than 10 minutes because we can predict who's coming. Right now, I think healthcare and hospitals are the only ones who open their doors every morning and many of them haven't even shut their doors in the night and don't know how many people are going to walk in. In an Indian hospital, you do not know. 85% of the people came in without an appointment. So simple. From as simple as that, as to at the extreme high end of it, I want our fresh registrar who just came into the hospital or the resident doctor to have the same capability as Dr. M.K. Mani, who's practiced nephrology for 35 years of the highest standard. And this is because we extracted the care protocol from the senior most physicians. We validated them with the latest learnings and techniques. We data analyzed the numbers and perfected those protocols. And we put them in one button at the touch of a hand in the ward, in the doctor's mobile phone, so that when he sees a doctor, the quality, when he sees a patient, the quality of the output of what he's saying is going to be as good as a physician who's practiced for 20 years. This does not mean that we're replacing the physician who practiced for 20 years. This means that we're enhancing the quality of care and more and more doctors can operate at that high level. Therefore, re we're reducing errors, improving quality of life and care, and ensuring that more and more people get care because of the efficiency with which this high quality doctor can spread his knowledge. Those are the changes which are coming and this is the way the hospital of the future will use artificial intelligence, deep learning, paperless hospital, wireless devices, digital ERs, connected theaters, every single technology that is available. Let's figure out ways to smarter, faster, easier. Bring it into the hospital and help it help patients. So the room of the future, the hospital room of the future, Hopefully, and there are many, there are as many as 27 different devices and connected programs which would, could go into this room of the future. From continuous monitoring of blood pressure, non invasive monitoring of uh, blood sugars, continuous monitoring of temperature, continuous monitoring of SpO2, and all not separate devices that the nurse has to stick in somewhere and wire somewhere and write some data somewhere else. Simple, seamless, you saw the tricorder yesterday. Simple, seamless devices. Simple x-rays which come to the room. If the ultrasound can be a small device attached to a smartphone, 
Isn't this something which will go to the room, you'll finish your ultrasound and you'll see one minute the patient will be watching a movie on Netflix and when the doctor walks in, the screen will change to show the x-ray, the ultrasound, the screen, the images, the EMR and this will be connected with your AI and it will give you prompts and you'll do treatment planning right there in the room and tell the patient what's happening. And there's more. Not enough, let's do more. Um, besides this care uh, kind of evolved protocolization and digitalization and deviceization of the hospital rooms and theaters, I think because we're all health sensible, health sense will take this device and this knowledge into the home. So the home is now becoming the hospital. And how is that happening? In your bedroom, number one is sleep. How many people are tired? Slightly, you know, not up there. Memory, start monitoring sleep, your pulse, your breathing. You reduce sleep apnea and snoring, you will bring down an X amount of the impact of future disease. The hospital is now in your bedroom. You don't have to visit the doctor for this. The doctor will be seeing you somewhere up there in some cloud. The bathroom, we need to keep some privacy there, but still the bathroom. We'll also have the smart scale, the digital mirror, the smart toothbrush. They're looking at hydration. They're picking up symptoms of your dentist. They'll give you appointments. The Google Home or some other device will tell you, your toothbrush, pick this up. Shall I book a doctor's appointment, a dentist appointment for you? You're not getting enough fluoride. Do something different. Your scale, of course, is the worst secret that all of us keep. In my uh, 29 years of marriage, I still haven't told my husband how much I weigh. It's my dark secret. But this bathroom scale will know what you weigh. It will also analyze your fat percentage. It will give suggestions on your diet. And that data which is going from your smart scale will move into your smart kitchen. And the kitchen, which has the fridge and all the other things, and the spoons and the forks. It may not be as simple as people trying to lose weight or be healthy. It may be a lady who has Alzheimer's. I'm sorry, Parkinson's. So Alzheimer's as well, possibly did she forget a medication. But Parkinson's where your hand is shaking so much that the spoon cannot reach the mouth. So you auto adjust for the tremor and restructure with the new spoons which are being made so that a patient with Parkinson's can eat better. And of course allergies. And you, you know a lot about that, Russ. So it's allergies, ingredient scanners, and finally maybe 3D food printers. Maybe we'll be printing our own food and make it look good and your apples will never have bruises on them and, and all the rest of it. So this is coming into your kitchen. It's definitely coming into your workplace from posture monitoring to please start moving to smart suggestions about you didn't sleep enough so do you want to carry this work home or you want to take a small snooze, whatever it is. And finally when we're exercising, besides a virtual assistant or this coach you will be tracking smart clothing, smart monitoring. Nike already has the little pulse that goes into the shoe. Many, many changes to the way we're looking at things at our life and the smart pill just got FDA approved so you know whether it's been taken whether the ingredients are getting so the whole environment out there is changing and the reason I did this quick snapshot into some of these changing things is that there are some people who were sitting in this room yesterday some of the young kids who said we've been coming to this conference for four years and we're hearing the same stuff but we're not seeing enough of it in the hospital. We're hearing the same stuff, but we're not seeing enough of it in the apps and the phones. The pace of change in the healthcare has to pick up. And it is actually, the world is changing faster than we know it. But we can remain and continue to be slightly resistant to that change. And we're finding 20 reasons why Watson is not going to work. Uh, on Onco, we're not finding the single reason on how to make AI work in cancer diagnostics so that we can deliver better care. It may not be Watson, it may be someone else, but let's go out there and make it happen. So I think that is the only reason that I gave this overview, is to request all of you who already know the subject, who are experts in your own way, uh, and doctors and hospitals, to say let's up the ante because with 
good technology embedded into our systems, we can deliver lower cost, higher quality and more accessible healthcare. Whether it's telemedicine or anything else, let's find a way to reach the unserved. Life is priceless and all of you know it better than anyone else in the world. Thank you.